In our last video, we discussed the various kinds of research methods and briefly discussed the pros and cons of each or the strengths and weaknesses of each, but now we're going to get more specific with experimentation and how psychologists ask and answer questions using experiments. One of the biggest things that you have to understand conceptually about experimentation is that it is the only research method, and it says that down here at the bottom of the slide. Please make sure that you get this either at the top or in the margin of the vocabulary notes that you have. Experiments are the only research method that isolates or allows the researcher to determine cause and effect. It's the only research method where you can say that one variable causes the other. This is essentially the opposite of a correlation because a correlation says that the two variables are a two-way street and that self-esteem can have an impact on depression just like depression can have an impact on self-esteem. Well, in an experiment, you would isolate that one would cause the other right, that one would be the cause and the other would be the effect. So like other sciences, experimentation forms the backbone of research in psychology. It really is the prestigious research method, I guess that's kind of a way to put it, um, but the famous experiments being Pavlov's salivating dogs that we're going to talk about in the learning unit, unit six, Milgram's obedience study, and that's the, the shock experiment, and Ash's line study, the conformity experiment, where um, both of those will be talked about in Unit 14 way down the road in our school year when we talk about social psychology. So <clears throat> on your notes, on the paper notes that I provide, you have like a vocabulary chart where I ask you to define the terms but then also to give an example. So what we're going to do is use an example experiment throughout our entire set of notes today. <clears throat> so you're going to, again, define the term in one column, but then as we give the example, make sure that you're writing down the example so that you really understand what each part of, a, of an experiment really looks like. So the hypothesis is a testable prediction, um, and it needs to be in an if-then statement, right? So um, in our experiment, our example, caffeine... Um, let's say, helps keep high school teachers alert and happy. So the if-then statement of the hypothesis would be, if a teacher drinks caffeine, then they are more alert and happier. You want to test the effects of caffeine on the behavior of high school teachers. Um, so in order to test that hypothesis, if a teacher drinks caffeine, then they will be more alert and happier. You have to isolate those two variables, right? At this point, once they have established their hypothesis, researchers will create an operational definition of the various aspects of their experiment. So they're going to say, okay, what about this caffeine thing? We need to operationally define that. We're going to give it to people in coffee, right? We're not going to do pop or soda. We're going to do coffee. Um, and then they're going to operationally define the dependent variable, which would be alertness and happiness. Okay, so maybe they determine that they're going to test alertness with some kind of alertness test of both vision and hearing, something like that. But they'll do that before, let's say, the week-long experiment starts and at the end, or maybe at various points throughout the week where they're drinking caffeine or not. And then happiness would probably be given in a survey, right? Because surveys are what we use to determine people's attitudes, beliefs, and opinions. So happiness rating at the beginning, before the experiment starts, at certain points throughout and at the end. So who's your population? It would be all high school teachers, right? Or more specifically, Oak Hills high school teachers if you were to do this experiment right now, right? <clears throat> so that's your entire population. There's what, 150 to 200 teachers at Oak Hills High School? Or let's say if you did all high school teachers, think about how many high school teachers there are in the nation or even in the state, right? There's tons. There's no way that you can test all of them, that you can manageably, um, without it getting too expensive and unmanageable, um, there's no way to experiment on all of them. So you need to get a representative sample. It's a smaller group that gives a snapshot of the total population. So what would that look like at Oak Hills, and how do you obtain this representative sample? Well, it's going to be a smaller amount of teachers, maybe like 20 to 30 of the teachers, okay? But how do you obtain that representative sample? Well, you got to do one of two things. You either have to do a random sample or a stratified sample. You have to understand these definitions. 
A random sample is when everyone in the population has an equal chance of being selected to participate in the experiment. So let's say you put all of the teacher's names into a hat and you draw out 60 names. Okay, that would be the random sample for our experiment. A stratified sample is a little more stratified, a little more strategic. The population is divided into relevant subcategories, let's say by subject area or by age, and a random sample is taken from each subcategory. So you divide the staff into categories, maybe male, female, new veteran, teachers, or subject areas, and then you select from there. Once you have your population, you should probably write this down <clears throat> before you start writing about experimental control group. Once you have your sample, once you have your random sample, then you randomly assign your participants into either the experimental or control group. The experimental group is the one that's going to receive the quote special treatment. They are going to get whatever it is that you are testing, which in this case is caffeine, right? So let's say you have group A is your experimental group. Participants drink two cups of regular caffeinated coffee every morning for a month, okay? So that would be our example. But then the control group would be the comparison group or groups. You can have multiple control groups. So let's say in our example experiment, we have two control groups. Group B, participants drink two cups of decaf coffee every morning for a month. Okay, so they do decaf. And then um, a group C, participants drink hot brown coffee flavored water for a month. And one of the next things we're going to talk about here with our two control groups here, do you think they know that they don't have caffeine? And even, even going backwards, do you think group A, the experimental groups, knows that they do have caffeine? That's a good question to ask yourself. Uh, <clears throat> let's really quickly, before we start talking about placebos, though, talk about random assignment. Once the sample is obtained, we kind of talked about this, researchers randomly assign participants to either group, experiment, or control. Assigning participants to either of these conditions by random assignment minimizes, and you should write this down, underline it, and grain it in your brain. It minimizes pre-existing differences between the two groups. Okay, so you could have people that are already addicted to caffeine or people who are insomniacs, right? And that's going to impact their alertness and happiness. So you randomly assign in order to control for those pre-existing differences. So how do you do this in our experiment? After the participants have gathered, you hand out numbered cards in no particular order um, to all of them to separate them into the two groups. Now you have your variables that you have to understand here. <clears throat> your independent variable is the cause. This is the one the experimenter assigns to the experimental and control group. So in our experiment, it is the type of drink. I'm going to assign to my experimental group, you are going to drink caffeine. And to my con two control groups, you're going to drink um, coffee flavored water, you're going to drink decaf coffee, right? They get the placebo. I'm going to, for a month, have them drink all of that stuff. And then at the end, I am measuring their behavior, their alertness, crankiness, their happiness. And that would be the dependent variable. That's the effect. So the caffeine is what I'm saying causes all of those things. So that's the independent variable. And all of those things, alertness, crankiness, happiness, would be what I measure. That's the effect. So the dependent variable is the factor that may change in response to the independent variable, in our case, the caffeine. In psychology, it's usually a behavior or mental process. So we've talked about this too. How do you measure that? You, the teachers fill out a questionnaire at the beginning to get a baseline data and then at the end or each day and at the end of the month. So our control groups, they're going to get a placebo, a pseudo treatment or fake treatment, right? Why would you have a placebo? Well, it's to test the true effects of the independent variable. Sometimes beliefs of the participants can actually alter their behavior. So what is the placebo in our experiment? It's the decaf coffee and then the coffee flavored water. But here's the thing, they can't know they have the placebo. They can't know that they either are drinking caffeine or not. So that's why we have blinds in our study. A single blind is where the participants don't know which group, experimental or control, they are. So in our experiment, the teachers don't know if they're drinking caffeine or not. In a double-blind experiment, the participants, as well as those gathering the data. So in our experiment, the teachers 
obviously would not know if they're getting caffeine or not, if they're in the experimental or control group. But then those who are gathering the data, so giving the teachers the surveys and collecting that, they won't know who is receiving caffeine or the placebo either. So which one's better and why? And this is something we really need to talk about because they both eliminate bias, but just think in a double blind, double blind is most often better because those gathering the data could even say to a teacher like, man, you feel pretty good today, don't you? Like they could act a certain way towards the participant knowing they do or don't drink caffeine or, oh, feeling a little sluggish, like didn't get your fix today, right? Like that'll cause then the person to be like, oh yeah, I really do feel kind of sluggish today. And that's gonna cause a bias and then a, a confounding variable in the experiment. So confounding variables. These are other items that could affect the outcome of the experiment other than the independent variable alone. As an experimenter, you want to isolate that it's only the independent variable causing any of the results in your research. So you have to control for any confounding outside variables that might impact your results. So what could be some confounding variables in our experiment? Well, there is still some caffeine in decaf coffee that could have an impact, um, but probably more even influential is that some people have experience with coffee prior to the experiment. Like some people are already regular coffee drinkers or even addicted to caffeine. And then amount of sleep, like what if someone is, you know, has like a new baby in the month of the experiment, like their sleep is altered, obviously, and that's going to cause them to be really sluggish and off, and that could confound the variables. But again, and I want you to answer the question at the bottom of your notes, how do you control for these confounding variables? Is it random sampling or a random assignment? Hopefully you understand that it's random assignment. If you don't, rewind and look back over where we talked about random assignment and experiments.